can start. Greetings, and welcome to you all. Um, I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and uh, before then, uh, Editor, Associate Publisher of the Wall Street Journal Europe, I've been watching China for many years. It's an honor for me not only to moderate this panel, but to moderate uh, six uh, individuals who can give us uh, a rich, uh, insight, both from personal experience of the past, uh, of, of China's past, but also who have vested interest and in many cases uh, a real role in, in China's future. Um, I will uh, go down the line to introduce the speakers. We won't necessarily go in that order as they talk. We've got a short one hour for a very big subject, so we'll try to go through this as efficiently as possible. What we're after is to take a look at the 30 years of Chinese reform. As you know, uh, it is one of the great success stories of economic history. And then the next 30 years, when we know no country is poised to have more of an impact on the world in the next 20, 30 years than China. And the real question is, uh, and that's unclear, is what sort of impact will it have? Uh, will it, as many predict in 2025, be the second largest economy, the largest user of natural resources, the biggest exporter? Uh, most uh, observers believe it will remain on a positive economic trajectory despite episodic slowdowns, but there is a mi minority that wonders about major shocks, uh, political or economic in nature. They believe that after 30 years of, of leading the global growth tables uh, that something's got to give. Um, so th we certainly have uh, the panel that will do this. Our job in the short time ahead will be to quickly list the success factors of the past 30 years, but really to use that as a takeoff point to look at how those success factors will be different for the next 30 years. We have an impressive group of business leaders, entrepreneurs, and an economist, and, uh, and they will go through that for us. Let me quickly um, list their names and their roles, and then I'll come back to them with the questions. We've got Guo Chuqing, Chairman of China Construction Bank, People's Republic of China, and also non-executive director of uh, the largest sovereign wealth fund, and I think we'll hear from him on both issues. John Hutton, Secretary of State for Business Enterprise and Regulatory Reform of the United Kingdom. Kyle Kochweiser, Vice Chairman, Deutsche Bank, United Kingdom. Lu Jiren, Chairman, Executive uh, Officer of Nusoft uh, Corporation. Uh, uh, Jim Quigley, James Quigley, Global Chief Executive Officer, Deloitte, and Zhang Chouqing, Vice Chairman of the National Development and Reform Commission of the People's Republic of China. Uh, let's get started. Uh, I'd like to actually open up uh, with John Hutton, if I could, uh, the uh, Secretary of State for Business, Enterprise, Regulatory Reform. Uh, Mr. Hutton, uh, you have given a recent speech talking about your great expectations for uh, Britain working together with China in the coming period of time. Uh, Gordon Brown has outlined a quite ambitious uh, um, bilateral relationship that is going to undergo a great deal of growth. As you look forward and you look past, what do you think the major factors for Chinese success will be uh, going forward in the next 30 years? Well, I think the success, success factors going forward will be the same factors that have brought about this extraordinary transformation in the Chinese economy that we've all seen in the last 30 years. And those success factors will depend on maintaining a dynamic private sector, free and fair open market, and a willingness to look out to the world and engage with the world. Now, obviously, these are all very difficult times for those of us who believe in openness and free and fair markets, but I think the evidence of the last 30 years, if we ever needed any new evidence about the importance of open markets and fair and, fair and free markets, is there for, for all to see. I think the danger, two dangers, I think would be a retreat into protectionism in the world, and you can already see some signs of a rising fear 
of openness and free markets arising in many parts of the world, probably in every continent of the world. We've got to join forces to resist that because that will be the enemy of progress. And I think the other big challenge for the next 30 years going forward will be how we can build greater sustainability into our economic and business models because I think there's no doubt at all that the pressure on global energy resources, we just take that for a second, is going to continue to exert significant pressure and possibly constraints on the rate of progress and development that we all want to see in the world. So I think the evidence of the success of these policies is visible all around us here. You just need to walk out of this hall and, and drive around and you see the, the, the benefits of, a, of an open market approach, a willingness to be part of this new global economy. And I personally believe there's, there's no going back from that now, but we, we have all got to be alert to the dangers so there's no overreaction to the current problems in the financial markets. And we, um, we base our policies on the future maybe a controversial thing for a politician to say, but on the basis of, of what works, the evidence of what works. And I think what works is, is, is readily available for all of us to, uh, to work out for ourselves just by walking out of this hall and taking a short walk across the, the main highway. Let, let me ask you a very quick follow-up on that. Um, you have said, uh, and I think these are two very good points, openness of the economy and also sustainability of the economy. Perhaps drill down a little bit more on that. Uh, uh, you've talked about uh, to succeed, truly succeed in today's global markets, all economic growth must be first and foremost sustainable. Uh, you've been talking about the increase of clean development mechanism projects and, and, and the UK companies would be heavily involved in this. What is it, this is one of the biggest challenges for China, environmental, what is it specifically you think China has to do, one or two quick examples uh, to, t to tackle this? Well, I think that what China needs to do is, is what China is already doing. I mean, I think there's a, a very sophisticated appreciation in China about some of the energy challenges that the country faces and some of the global environmental changes that are underway that we've, we've got to work on. I mean, you mentioned, I think, the, the clean development mechanism. I think that's a very practical bit of financial engineering that will help us transfer resources to where they're most needed and where we can make the, the biggest economically efficient impact on reducing, for example, carbon and other pollutants being emitted into the atmosphere. I, I think we've got to work together on this. I mean, I, I know it's a cliché. Politicians tend to trade in, in clichés, but there is, there is no one country that is going to be able to resolve these problems acting independently. And I think energy will be right at the heart of this huge global challenge in the next 30 years. It is the fundamental commodity that's going to drive not just economic progress, but social progress. And of course, the, the great the beneficiaries, if you like, of globalization have been the world's poorest people because the rate of progress out of world poverty has never been faster in this, in this last 30 years as the world has become a more open, a more liberal, a more free trading environment. So I think the cooperation between countries is crucial. The relationship between the UK and China, particularly in areas like CDM, is very, very strong. I mean, and we will continue to use our technology, our resources, our expertise to support the incredible work that has been done in countries like China and around the world to help us reach this um, challenge on, on sustainability. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, John Hutton. Zhao Chuqing, um, you have a role as Vice Chairman National De Development Reform Commission, but you also are non-executive director of the China Investment Corporation. Um, 200 billion U.S. dollars of assets under management, which makes it the fourth largest sovereign wealth fund. We all sort of want to know uh, your view of the past, but I'd also very much like to know uh, what China will do with its 1.7 billion dollars of, uh, of and growing at perhaps uh, 2 trillion at this point, the uh, uh, 1.7 trillion to 2 trillion. Uh, in, in the next 30 years, how, much, how should this be best spent uh, as, you, uh, as you give us your comments on the past 30 and the future 30 years? Okay. This year is the 30th of China's reform and opening. And China successfully you know, fulfilled his uh, great achievement of transformation from uh, you know, formal closed and semi-closed planned economy to a uh, we call a social market economy, featuring with the all round opening up to the outside world. And the real GDP of China is 15 times, and the real per capita income of urban and rural residents 
is 7.5 and 7.3 times more than that of 1978 in the year 2007. So I think that the fundamental experience over the past 30 years lays in the factors that China have taken and adhered to the socialist path, which is in the line with our national circumstances. In practice, we keep opening up our mind and be abreast with the times, persisting in the, our intention of reform and opening up. We are focusing on economic growth, productivity forces, emancipation, and institutional reform and improvement. I think that's the very important experience. And also, we pay greater attention to learn and from and draw upon the experience of other countries, which together help China strong vitality and development continuously. So based on those experience, I think, look at the future, 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, we must, you know, persist on our successful experience. I should mention about four or three points, but the basic principle is that China will bring into play the concept we call the scientific development, that is human-centered, coordinated, and sustainable development. Of course, it still needs opening furthermore and persist on the reform. First of all, still we will, you know, for the effort to transfer the model of our development, push forward our economic restructuring. You know, currently China's development is relying too much on investment and export. So we will take the policies, you know, make a well coordination between the consumption, particularly the consumers' consumption, investment, and export. Of course, we will follow the way we call the new industrialization, which gives the priority to the energy consumption, emission reduction, and develop the circular economy. The secondly, we will still pay greater attention for the agricultural farmers and rural areas. This is really the foundation for China's long-term sustainable development. And of course, we should at the same time to improve the basic system of our social security, which can cover both urban and rural residents so as to improve the well-being of the country, all over the country. The thirdly, I think, we need to furthermore promote a balanced development among the different regions of China. China is a big country. In the coastal areas, like Tianjin or Dalian, it's relatively well developed. But in the interland ways, it is still a lot of things need to be done. And uh, the fourth thing I think very important is that the reform will be go ahead to improve the systems and mechanisms. For example, we will to in one hand improve our basic economic system in which the public ownership is dominant, but at the same time the different other ownerships also need to be developed side by side. And of course, the further improvement for our macroeconomic regulation need to be improved. Particularly, the current financial crisis allow us to learn some of things, how 
to regulate a modern financial system. And of course, we need to enable the marketplace play a better and more important role, just like Ms. Hilton mentioned, the free market. We call we should allow the markets play a basic role for the resource allocation. And uh, of course, when we mention the reform, we must also push ahead the political system reform, including to develop our democratic system and also our legal system. The aim is to build a harmonious society. And of course, China's development cannot be isolated from the world. So we will expand opening up in answer the scope of the depths of China. And particularly the new direction is that we will encourage to develop the win-win cooperation between China and the world. The people of our countries, we do believe that should join the hands and to strive to build a harmonious and a lasting peace and a common prosperity world, such like the challenge, the climate change, it cannot be solved by the single country. That's my views about the direction for the future reform. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the precision with which you outlined the future, uh, one could listen to that and say, well, let's see if they can achieve all those things. But only by going back 30 years can you actually see that one said some things at that point that nobody believed could be achieved, and they were. So at this point, I'm actually going to turn to Kyle Koch Weiser. Uh, he's, he's in the program as vice chairman of Deutsche Bank, but, but, but for the purposes of this panel, he was here from the beginning. If I'm not mistaken, Kayo, you advised the Chinese leadership and system reformers under Deng Xiaoping in 1980 and were involved right from the start. So perhaps you can pick up uh, the ball from here and give us a feeling of what you saw then, what was set in motion then that made this work, and what's the parallel now? What has to be set in motion now? Well, first of all, Fred, I think it's very appropriate to take this look back 30 years and look forward several decades because if there's one thing I've learned is China thinks in terms of time horizon long term much more strategically than we do in the West and more important has the ability to enact long term visions more than we have uh, often in the, in the West. Yes, I think it's worth looking back and see where this started 30 years ago. And I should have said while you were at the World Bank. That, that, that yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were very much involved through the World Bank. China, 30 years ago, very poor country, but amazing how it had met at least the basic needs of its population. A country that had an amazingly high share of industry and GDP for a low-income country and had a large agriculture sector, which means, of course, basically no services, very low consumption, and since 1960, almost total international isolation. That was the starting point. Now comes the, the policies after 79. A very clear ambition formulated by the leadership of quadrupling uh, combined agriculture industrial output still under the old material balance uh, national accounts by 2000, quadrupling. Uh, of course, very high savings and investment rates uh, here, relying for innovation and uh, and capital very much on uh, FDI and the openness, the export-led growth, which brought with it then again in a surprisingly sophisticated composition of exports for a still relatively low-income country. And uh, all this with a reform approach, which I like to call very innovative experimentation, but always with caution. Feel the stones as you cross the river. Now, the miracle we all know, uh, China has been the fastest growing economy in the world since 1978, and it is a miracle. But it also, of course, meant that there are new imbalances, savings over investment, large current account surpluses, China importing capital, Chinese uh, people foregoing consumption, in a sense, for low return assets they hold abroad. We know the situation. Inefficient investment because its savings rates 
were so high. And now I come to the future. I think I want to make three points, and the points have already been made by some colleagues uh, before. Number one, I truly believe that what is now underway is like from isolation to openness 30 years ago, another transformation now, equally well done, from excessively export-led growth to domestic demand, domestic consumption, balancing the domestic and the external sector. This is really a paradigm shift here and has to go much, much further. It is underway. Uh, and I believe that uh, measures such as old security systems, pension reform, bringing down precautionary savings, the investments now in infrastructure in the hinterlands and education, I think very important the role hinterland or inland provinces will play, Heilongjiang, Sichuan already growing faster than coastal regions, all that points to this paradigm shift and I think it will also address to some point the worrisome inequality of income that has developed over those uh, course of the year. What's my take on what this means by growth? I think probably in the longer run, we are talking here long term, not the next few years, probably growth in the order of 8% because with 1% population growth, you will not be over the next 15 years be able in the 9, 10, 11 range. First point. Second point, very much agreeing with what has been said by John Tom before, I think the art will now be to pursue a pathway that meets the twin objectives of continued rapid growth, 8%, with, on the other hand, a much more commodity, resource, saving, and climate-friendly uh, uh, performance. It is really a carbon revolution, an energy efficiency revolution that this country, I believe, can, can master. And uh, I think, the, just look at the energy intensity uh, uh, indicators, there is a lot that can be done. So efficiency of energy use, uh, renewables, wind power, all this is coming up. Uh, very important technology for uh, carbon uh, storage, capture and storage because coal will be the source. This pathway with the twin objectives will be absolutely critical. And on the external front, I would say China has to join the global climate deal, because what we are shaping here in, in Copenhagen 09 or later is what will impact the world economy and humankind until 2050, when China will be the largest economy, the largest energy user. It's your negotiations, in a sense, China, join that uh, process. Third point, very quickly, I think what this all requires is that China goes beyond taking uh, admirably into account the impact of their own policies on neighboring countries on the world economy, a good player in the global context in that sense. But China has to go a step further. We will have a certain vacuum given the relative decline of American economic power. We will have on all the issues, short term, we now see international regulation, climate, all that, a need for leadership. And my big question is, will China have the human resources, the political culture, to assume that leadership? Not unilaterally, but in a carefully orchestrated multilateral framework. Does it have the people for that? Will it do that? That's my big question, actually, to all of us, because it's absolutely required to make the 30, next 30 years as much of a miracle as the last 30 years have been. I think, I think that's a absolutely vital point. It's not just take care of your uh, energy uh, and environmental issues, but it's lead the world in those issues, but not only lead not the world... Not these all issues. Right. Not only of those issues, but other, other uh, global governance issues. Uh, Guo Xuqing, um, you're chairman of uh, the China Construction Bank, if I'm not mistaken, second largest uh, in China in terms of assets. More important for our purposes here, perhaps, is that you're in 13,000 uh, cities throughout uh, the country, so you know China in every major place or in every even very smaller places through, through the country. So from your standpoint, what are the prospects for growth uh, for China in the next 30 years? Do you agree with this 8%? 8 per, 8 will China surpass the U.S.? And if so, what factors will it take over the next 20 years for China to get there? Thank you very much. About the past uh, 30 years, uh, the success factor, I think there are three major things. First is economic reform, the restructuring of the economic system. S second is the opening up to the rest of the world. Third one is the social and political stability, including the you know, internal and external you know, um, diplomacy, uh, you know, uh, policy, you know, the foreign policy, yes, and peace policy. 
talking about the coming next 30 years, uh, I think in general, if uh, without any big you know, exception, I think that China can continue the growth at a very high uh, growth rate. And after the 30 years, I think we, we can be uh, one of the developed countries. Uh, the major you know, uh, good advantages is because we already have a market-oriented economic system as first. And uh, I don't think the economic reform can be reversal, reversed. Secondly, the industrialization and the urbanization, and also we in the you know, information age. So that kind of the trend cannot be changed. That developed very fast in China, from coastline to the inland, you know, then to the western uh, area. Already happening, because in the, this year, for example, the. Uh, um, Inland, you know, areas and western areas, the growth rate much higher, you know, than the coastline. Certainly, I think China is just still the largest, uh, you know, uh, population. Maybe India, in some in the coming years, maybe become the number one. But still, China is, you know, big enough huh, in terms of the market, in terms of the uh, human resources. So I think that that is a major three uh, advantages for the future. But we I sometimes got some you know, disadvantages. First, you know, as uh, everybody mentioned, that is the uh, environment and uh, uh, you know, the uh, raw material constraints, resources constraints first. And the secondly, is uh, the aging population. China become a poor country, they become the older country. You know, people become you know, already older. And thirdly, because we got some uh, imbalanced development structure problems in the rural and uh, you know, urban area, between the rural and the urban area, and between the, you know, the coast and the inland, and also the original uh, differences. But I think even this is a factor that is very important, but for, for us, uh, the, I think the most important things, issues, I think it's three. First is uh, human capital. Development, human resource, or you maybe say that is uh, intellectual cap capital, is most important for China in the coming 30 years. Why? Because in the past 30 years, we are mainly at a, a, a lower level that uh, you can say is a factor driven growth or efficiency driven growth. But in the coming 10 years, or the 15 years, or 20 years, we certainly have to transform to a uh, intellectual, human capital, you know, or innovation-driven growth model or pattern. But China's education system, and including the science and the technology management system, I think is far away from that. It's a big challenge for us. Second, I think is that already our colleagues mentioned that is the legal and the political system is the most important things. Uh, we, thirdly, I think we still need a, a proper macroeconomic policy, uh, especially we should learn something from the past 10 years, uh, not only in China but also in the U US. I think why we got a problem, you know, and, and, and Japan maybe. Uh, I think this is because the uh, macroeconomic policy, always the government, even the independent central bankers, still sometimes it's, it's growth-oriented. They, they prefer to, the, to maintain the high growth rate. That's, you know, made the bubble and such, such kind of things. Of course, we still need the further reform. I think the most important is the two areas. First is separate the, the government and the market. Or in other words, that is making clear the different functions of the market and the government. Because we still have a lot of uh, area we got to market, you know, uh, not play the you know basic roles. Got a lot of uh, marketing you know, dist distortions. For example, energy price, and for example, the, the, uh, the other kind of area, social security, public services, and non-government services, uh, organizations, such kind of things. Secondly, I think the reform area is the most important is to uh, really make a balanced development. Uh, between the uh, rural and the urban areas. That's a major thing. It's a policy, so it made the, the parents 
the rural residents, they all have the equal identity status, you know, with the residents in the urban areas. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me turn to uh, 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 Jim Quigley at this point. Um, we've got a list building up here of uh, factors for the future, sustainable environment, global leadership, both in environment and other issues, openness, uh, uh, consumption, investment, a very good list being drawn up here. As you look at this from your standpoint as, as, uh, as CEO, uh, global CEO uh, Deloitte, um, uh, you can put this together with global factors where China is going to be competing for capital with many others, etc. Looking forward, what are the factors that you think will define success, but also maybe you can touch on some factors that you think are landmines, uh, areas where China will have to avoid making, uh, making certain mistakes at the same time? Well, I think to just comment very briefly on the success of the past and try to avoid being redundant of all the comments that have been made because I agree with them, I would just simply applaud the miracle that has occurred and the incredible sustained performance and then ask, you know, can we use the wonderful job that was done with the Olympics as a way to bridge to the future? And what I mean by that is I think that many people were sort of in awe of the brilliance of the Olympics because they had a different mental image of China and they let that mental image of China be built up by this idea of a low-cost factory exporting to the world and yet they saw this high-tech innovative brilliant performance and can that truly bridge to what China's future is going to be and I think that's the key to success is can China now take that next step and use innovation and begin to move manufacturing up the value chain to higher tech kinds of manufacturing just like the Airbus uh, investments coming here can that become repeatable and then scaled because I think what's going to happen is getting to where we are is impressive, very impressive. But some of what brought us here isn't going to take us to that next level or keep us on that trajectory. And so I think this economy has to begin to transform to those higher value kinds of manufacturing in order to do that, as well as diversify, as has been pointed out, and build that consumer base while maintaining continued investment in infrastructure. And I think if, we, if China stumbles and is not able to take that next step, then I think there's a risk of plateauing rather than maintaining the trajectory that is currently enjoyed. And I believe that the degree of difficulty of staying on this trajectory for the next 30 years is actually going to be higher than the degree of difficulty of what's been accomplished. And I can even personalize that to Deloitte and say, I'm thrilled with Deloitte going from you know, 200 people in China to 8,000 people in China today. But as I aspire, even in the next five years of getting to 15,000, I think the degree of difficulty of doing that is very high, perhaps even higher than getting to 8,000. Just like I think the degree of difficulty for China to maintain the trajectory and as that economy gets ever larger and its seat on the global stage in the global economy ever more important, then staying at 8% is going to be very difficult as you compete for capital and as you compete for those jobs and those opportunities to produce income at that level and continue the job creation that has been enjoyed. But I think the degree of difficulty is even going to be higher. Uh, give, give me an example of what you think will be most difficult, the most difficult single factor that they must achieve, that China must achieve in the next 30 years. I think the ability to just integrate technology into the value platform so that it isn't just you know, a low-cost labor play that is being pushed out there. It's the brilliance of the staging of the Olympics that just simply starts to become the platform and the way that we think about China. And that the world then has to replace that image with what will be this innovative leader on so many stages that I think is definitely possible and I'm even optimistic that I think it'll be realized but I think the degree of difficulty for that transformation is very high. Uh, 
Thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jim Quigley, I think, is singing your song, Lu uh chairman of, uh, and, and CEO of NUSAF. Um, I have a particular weak spot for entrepreneurs, um, and this man started a company in 1988 with, I think, three people, uh, 30,000 RMB, and now 14,000 employees, $500 million business. Um, uh, Asian Innovator of the Year, uh, as picked by CNBC Asia. From the standpoint of the entrepreneur, there's lots of talk now about China needing to change its model uh, uh, going forward, to change the business model in some way. Uh, lower cost manufacturers will come up, have to move on to the next stage. Uh, what is your view, and what does that mean to you? Do you become Microsoft? Uh, is that your competitor? What happens specifically also to your company as you take on uh, this next 30 years? Uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of comments about uh, China economic structure. Uh, in fact, uh, inside of China is a lot of discussions uh, about uh, what is uh, the pattern of the growth of China in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. A lot of uh, critics about uh, the China economic structure. We are very much uh, resources uh, intensive. We are, you know, uh, consume a lot of resources. We compete only by the low cost. We destroy the uh, environment. So a lot of talk about China need to quick from manufacturing to find the new business model that is services, high tech, more R&D. So my personal opinion, I don't think China is in that stage to quick from manufacturing. We are very hard to really got a competitive advantage in services sector in very short term. If we quit from manufacturing, I don't think China have the value can contribute to global economics. So I say if China want, really want to, to switch from manufacturing to services, the opportunity will come from manufacturing. If the company, the product maker, a low cost product maker, they spend more and more money for R&D, for ju uh, from just manufacturing assembly to innovation, I think it will create more and more job of opportunity of services. So that means the innovation of services in China model should come from manufacturing. So you know, I, we, we are a software company. Now uh, we're growing fast. We have a 14,000 employee uh, working in uh, software development for many of uh, excellent global uh, customers. But I don't think we can like you know, 200 million, 300 million people, they already work in manufacturing business. They switch to those kind of services. If we look at the patterns of growth of China in past, I think China is very, very successful. The success is we like 200 million or 300 million farmer young people switch from rural areas to join the manufacturing we create a lot of job opportunity. That kind of opportunity is a totally change the life of Chinese. Uh, because if you say the rural areas, uh, each of family, they really uh, cost very, very little. If they have uh, one young people come to a city, they got job. They totally change the life of a total, uh, you know, whole family. So if we cannot keep the reasonable size of manufacturing that will like uh, some of uh, people they lost job they come from rural areas in past 30 years but now they need to go back I don't think the rural areas can afford another 100 million young people go back to to serve to agriculture business so we must be very very carefully to thinking about our country. We cannot work in only an idea. We, we say we are a great country, we make a great achievement, we have a lot of money today, and then we try to do everything 
No, developed country can it do it did. So I don't think we are in a stretch. China need to transform from manufacturing state by state. We need to take a very practice, very solid policy. I think in the past, uh, uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping is great. His great is because he don't take any kind of uh, theory uh, ideas from outside. They really make a kind of uh, political decision just uh, based on Chinese situation. So uh, that is my, uh, my, you know, my, my thoughts about uh, that. I think uh, China will be innovation in manufacturing. We need a uh, cost uh, less energy, more efficient. Uh, even our current opposite today, but we need to build a kind of a core competence still like us, very competitive. I think we, 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 we can learn something from Japanese. There are 30 years, the history after, you know, Japanese uh, to got become more stronger, the export, their product export to United States. So they have some problem about the current uh, opposite. They have problem, uh, the product is not good quality. But uh, China today need to do same kind of thing. We need to find the right methodology, innovation in our pro uh, product uh, uh, the manufacturing process. We need to have a more and more design house, not only assembly, we need to have our own brand. Those kind of things, I think, is a change of China to drive the economic to, to continue growing. That's a very, very interesting statement because it's saying, go in the direction of Japan, keep your manufacturing, move it upscale, move your services together in software with the manufacturing, but make sure you don't let go of your manufacturing both for economic and political reasons. Yes, yeah. if we say uh, Japan yeah. is a good uh, service sector, but the 30 percent of the services, the business, uh, the growing is come from manufacturing. If we say a mobile phone, digital camera, uh, digital TV, even a car, they generate a lot of services opportunity. They make uh, the the people uh, switch from manufacturing to R and D to the services. I think that is the same kind of model. We need to think about those kind of models. It's not just uh, separate the manufacturing with the services. Thank you very much. I see uh, first question there, and, and let's go to questions to the audience. Thank you. Uh, question to the panelists. Uh, and, and if you could identify yourself and ask and say to whom you'd like to direct. I, I'm working with Goldman Sachs China. Uh, my question is, uh, for the, the U.S. Congress, they are in uh, a great debate on the 700 billion U.S. dollars bailout for the Wall Street. And they are quite concerned with using taxpayers' money to pay the bill. Here in China, a lot of discussions going on um, on whether the, the bill is going to pay not only by U.S., but uh, shared by the world. You know, uh, whether Chinese taxpayer will, will pay the bill the bill because uh, our foreign exchange reserve uh, made a lot of investment in U.S. Treasury bill. Could you make some comments on that? Uh, I think we'll go uh, perhaps to Mr. Uh, Mr. Zhang, left right in the nick of time. The, uh, uh, the who, on, who wants to handle this, um, this question? Mr. Mr. Guo, Kyle, um, I think part of the question also is, is the U.S. government bailing out the Chinese investor if you look at the amount of Chinese money that's in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Um, but, um, May I see that? Please, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, not very clear about your question. What is mean? Do you mean by contribute to the that uh, rescue planning? But in terms of uh, China's uh, largest. Uh, Foreign exchange reserve uh, holder and the largest capital exporter already uh, in the past uh, five years. And uh, probably this year or next year is the largest uh, commodity exporter, exceeded uh, Germany. Sorry about that. And uh, I think certainly we already pay something. Because when you hold the U.S. dollars as a major foreign exchange reserve, 
as a major foreign exchange you know, asset, all the banks, and including central bank, commercial banks, and some business enterprises, already paid a lot. Uh, I think, uh, for example, some maybe have some uh, you know transactions with the uh, Lehman Brothers. When the Lehman fail, they really become you know a uh, risk, big risk. They cannot get money back. Some institutions buy some you know uh, corporate bonds. That's kind of uh, maybe it's, uh, Lehman, maybe it's, uh, other companies or uh, Volmo. Uh, they already, you know, sacrifice that. So I think we already uh, did something, you know, to help the U.S. But I think still we need to stress the U.S. financial market is not only U.S. itself. It's really it's a world financial market. It's, uh, if the market improves, like our you know, leader, President Hu Jintao and Premier Wen Jiaba mentioned. That's a, it's good for the U.S., it's good for every country, of course, including China. I, I think we need still more closer uh, cooperation between the central bankers and uh, uh, all the countries' the governments. Thank you very much. Jim, quickly, did you want to address that? Yep. Not a lot to add. There's no question that we are interdependent and it is an integrated global economy yeah. and if the largest economy has a problem, there is a ripple effect and while the U.S. taxpayers will be required to step up, uh, it's in also everybody's best interest for us to get this behind us and get this economy expanding and get the U.S. stabilized and the global financial markets also out of the turmoil that we certainly have witnessed in the last 30 days. Yep, very quickly. Yeah, Kyle, on just, to say that I think the point some of us made of China shifting more to domestic demand to uh, balance exports is very timely also in light of the, the recent turmoil without elaborating now. Secondly, that if that shift happens, Obviously, the savings, consumption, the current account surplus situation, not talking about tomorrow, but in the next five, ten years, will be very different. And therefore, even institutions like uh, the sovereign wealth funds, which you alluded to, to my mind, is a temporary phenomenon uh, in terms of long-term perspective, because China is still a relatively low-income country, should not be a major uh, capital uh, exporter. So I think these trends now fit the new global environment, which will be radically changed from the financial real economy side uh, very well. Final point, on the real economy, I'm a bit concerned. I see that Chinese exports to the U.S. are highly sensitive to the rate of growth in the U.S. A 1% decline in U.S. growth, and we'll have 0 or 0 to 1% growth, I believe, next year in the U.S., means 7% decline in Chinese exports to the U.S. Now, China is diversifying its export markets and so on, but the real economy effect could be substantial. And, and Japan and Europe could slow down as well, which are the other two major export debt. No. Well, just, just very briefly, if I can add to, to what has already been said, I think it's absolutely imperative that there is a deal struck soon. I think if the markets open again on Monday and there is no deal, I think it's going to be a very serious situation. So we've got to get this deal done. But I think that then there is an equally important issue about what we are going to do in the future. Because look, th this problem is a really fundamental structural problem in the way some of these markets have been inadequately regulated. And we've got to deal with that issue as we look for a solution to the current problem. And I think th there are two parts of this equation. There is the, the deal that needs to be struck now to spread the risk of contagion, and the risk is a very real one, and, and I agree with what has been said in every capital market in the world. You, you, there is not just a problem in the US, as Jim and others have said. But we've really then got to turn our attention globally, as a global community, where everything is at risk because of this, this failure in the financial markets. We've got to turn our attention globally to getting a solution so that we can, as far as reasonably possible, there's always a risk here, and you can't regulate your way out of every risk, but there's a better prospect in the future 
that we do not see a repeat of what has happened in the last 12 months because the consequences of that too, I think, would be, would be pretty formidable and, and dangerous and would threaten the economic uh, progress of, of, of the world economy. Yeah. Let's go. Um, from Phoenix TV, may I use Chinese? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm from Phoenix uh, TV. Uh, we are a partner to this uh, forum. I would like to ask a question to Mr. Guo Shu uh, When buying, uh, after buying the uh, stocks of uh, Construction Bank of China by Hui Jin, uh, what will be the impact on the equity structure of CBC and uh, what what will be the effect on the market value value of the uh, uh, China uh, Chinese construction bank so far uh, the the uh, amount of uh, stock purchase is very limited Originally, before buying, it is already uh, the largest shareholder, and after buying uh, the additional uh, uh, shares, it is uh, still the largest shareholder of our uh, bank, and it will not affect too much on the uh, management of uh, the uh, the bank. And also, with regard to the, uh, the, the stock price, uh, we're, we're subject to limitations, and we can't comment on market uh, prices. Thank you. I, I work for Russian Business Magazine Expert in Hong Kong. I have a question for all the members of the panel. I'd like to ask you if you think that China is ready to export its economic miracle, like, like overseas. So what we've seen in the 20th century, a competition between Soviet model of socialism and, and Western model. Uh, what we see now, especially in Africa, when China is investing a lot, China is uh, inviting students from Africa to study in China. So basically we see another competition between Western model and Chinese model. And I just wanted to ask you if you see China, like Beijing, uh, becoming a new, in, in, a new intellectual center. Like will we see in the future uh, students like wanting to study economics, like coming not to Oxford and Harvard, but to Beijing University? Like, like this is happening or not. Thank you. Uh, some people would say that the U.S. is going in an authoritarian capitalist model, but uh, we, we, we won't, we won't, we won't <laughs> go there. Um, the, uh, uh, he asked everyone on the panel, but I think it would be good if, uh, uh, if we had one or two of you take it on since we have so many questions. Who wants to deal with this? Is China basically uh, and Russia coming up with an alternative economic model that may be attractive uh, to others and, and in, a, in a way replace uh, the Western model that's been uh, that's been accepted. Okay. So, uh, uh, I don't know. You, you know, I'm a businessman. I, I don't know what what is mean really means uh, China model and the West model. Just I can use uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping's word is I don't care about white cat and uh, black cat. If you can catch a mouse, it's a good cat. So uh, that means uh, the, you know the world is changing a lot. Uh, China, you know, we are we are socialist country. But if you ask a Japanese, he said Japan is more socialist than us. The Japanese say China is a capitalist country. And right now, the U.S. is the most uh, you know socialist country. Yeah, I, I think financial <laughs> socialism. Yeah. The world is changing a lot. Yeah, you see, 80 percent is hold by the government. Yeah, yeah. Sunny May from back is 100 percent hold by the government. It's very hard to say uh, that the model is uh, it's very much very much a fusion. Uh, even though culture, technology. We, we, we come to small village, the people to learn each other. Uh, if you look at Japan, they learn a lot from the United States. If you, you see the China, they learn from all of them. But in future, if, we, if you see uh, some country like uh, Vietnam, they also learn something from China. So uh, I say uh, we, uh, for Chinese, uh, we have a challenge. We really need to understand the uh, culture of Western a world is because China is too close in past, and we just open uh, the really the, the period uh, like us to 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 understand the Western world is just the past ten years. 
and even we we、uh, we open our door for 30 years, but another 20 years, I don't think it is really open. So uh, uh, I say the future uh, maybe uh, I don't know whether we can unify. I don't think we can unify, but it's a colorful culture, colorful business model. The people will have their own choice. So I I just say that that the movie today is.、Uh, One of England cooker to run the Chinese restaurant is in London. It's really a surprise for me. Did you? I think our global economy is by far too complex to talk about. This is now the right model. That was the right model is not any longer. I think we are all searching, and I think one characteristic of Chinese reform, which was this bold, innovative experimentation, but at the same time being very cautious. Not only the cats, but also the stone. How you cross the river、uh, has a lot to tell the world. And I think, from my own experience in the World Bank in Africa, already years back, how you overcome poverty, how you organize basic services at community levels, China was used very often as example for specific policies or projects. Uh, in Africa, I think it comes back, Fred, also to the point some of us made on future leadership. China has to come much more into a leading position in shaping the global context, which is learning together. This morning, there was a session with Chairman Liu Mikang, where we talked about regulatory cooperation in the future. And I would argue that China belongs now into some of these international regulatory bodies of the G7, so we do this together. In that sense, it could be a model. Um, we're, we're down to the last couple of minutes. I apologize. There, there's so many people asking questions, and I've tried to go with the first people I've seen. Let's take two last questions here, and then we'll go back to the panel. Please. From the, wait, from the Oriental Post in, in Shanghai, a research pointed out that there will be 300 million elders by the year 2040 in China. However, the current social security only covers less than one fourth of the nation. Even in Beijing, Shanghai, these cities,、uh, it only covers about 50 percent to 60 percent. I'd like to know your brief comment on the challenges the Chinese social security is facing in the next 30 years. Thank you. To anyone in specific, you ask the question of anyone in specific. Yeah. Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank, and、uh, okay. okay, there we go. Great, thank you. One, one more question. One more, one more question. You can't come in every single. Yeah, not enough money. Yeah, no, no, we'll get. We'll. We'll. Be,、uh, let, let's get one more question, and then we'll get to a final round here. You have that. You have that. Ada Butambara from Zimbabwe. Uh, the third years of reform.、Um, we want to see some changes in the business model of China in Africa. Uh, Africans aspire to move up the global value chains. Right now, most of the activities of China and Africa is about extracting raw materials, commodities. Is it possible to have China bring manufacturing into Africa, partner with Africa, process minerals in Africa, build cars, build computers in Africa, sell to Africa, sell to the world? How can China assist Africa to move up the global value chain? The, um, let's take those as、uh, we've run out, running out of time. Let's take those as the last two questions.、Uh, let's start with Africa and then end on demographics. Who wants to take on、uh, Africa? Mr. Go, do you want to? Because you would be uh, uh, the uh, person, and maybe also Lucia. Yes,、so、I think、uh, we, we we really want to develop you know further、uh, economic and trade relations with、uh, African countries. Uh, actually, it's happened very fast.、Uh, uh, Benefit by the, the both sides is very good, and、uh, I think we can, you know, invest more, much more, in Africa and other, you know, developing countries. Because at the moment we have two、uh, trillion U.S. dollars mainly in the foreign exchange reserve in the currency, you know,、uh, financial assets. I think at least a certain proportion should be changed into the、uh, FDI. You know, or to the、uh, including、uh, you know African countries, you know the such kind of、uh, investment uh, you know uh, uh, countries target, and uh, uh, it's quite likely to you know to build some you know, joint ventures to、uh, you know manufacture and also the services industries that need we 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 should you know the both sides you know governmental and、uh, 
uh, intellectual, you know, and also the entrepreneurs, uh, corporations. I think this is, this is very, very important. Uh, yes, I think it uh, should be uh, because Africa is an emerging market and all people want to come in. But if you, you look at uh, the, the experience of China, when we just open our door, we have the same kind of uh, situation. We want to attract all the investment come to us to make uh, build their development, uh, you know, manufacturing center here. But it's not so easy because the people in very beginning is not trust you. Uh, you need a very good system. You need to very much transparent. You need to open. You need a good infrastructure. Also for manufacturing, you need a very good uh, supply chain, logistic, and everything. So you need to stay by stay. I think uh, the past 30 years of China, the 10 years, we spent more than 10 years to build those kind of very, very fundamental matters. And then we take off. So that means 30 years, uh, maybe a fast growing is just in past 10 years. So. Uh, I think uh, that that is uh, some experience we can share with you. Thank you. And uh, uh, Kyle, uh, the question of demographics, is there a demographic time bomb ticking? And if so, what does one, what is China do about it? Let me also just say on Africa that I think uh, what China now does mainly in infrastructure is highly beneficial. There are some projects, however, where I think local capacity building and not relying on an enclave kind of approach would be beneficial. Africa, you cannot generalize. The countries that are leading the way with good policy reform and investment environments will soon also attract Chinese investments from companies, and uh, China can contribute here a lot, including agro-processing and so on. On Social Security, not, it's obviously a time bomb, but the government is working on it, and uh, I think the big question is how you move from the present system where you have high precautionary savings even at household levels because people don't trust their old age security to a system that is fully funded. And there were pilot projects also in Northeast China, how to design systems that are notionally funded and fully funded later, but basically put a social security system in place. It's, I think, high priority under the rubric of domestic market development. Otherwise, it is a time bomb. Yeah, just one or two um, comments on the demographic changes because in the UK right now we're, we're living through this, this extraordinary change. There are now more people over the age of 65 than there are young people under the age of 16 and that's the first time that's happened in the UK. Now every country will design its own solutions whether it's health care systems and social care support systems. That's a matter for each, each country but I, I would just off, offer this observation. I think the countries that are both that are going to best deal with this challenge of demographic change are those countries that have the strongest family support structures in place. In the UK, we've seen a disintegration in the traditional family structure. So more of the health and social care costs have been borne in our social security system, and that is imposing a very substantial amount of extra cost into the public expenditure plans of the country. Now, we will obviously try and deal with that as best we can, but I think countries who will come best through this process of change, managing this transition, are those that um, can keep their family support systems in place. And the other thing, of course, in the UK, the thing about uh, an ageing society is that it's, it'll also be a healthier society. As China becomes an older society, the health of the pop Chinese population will improve significantly too because of the investments that are taking place in health uh, and other sort of public health initiatives. So people will be able to work longer. I mean, this is the thing that reality that we've had to come to terms with in the UK. Um, people are going to work longer, and they work longer, they have a better chance of saving for their retirement and taking responsibility for themselves in old age, because you, you've got to have the, the right mix between what individuals do to prepare for that, that change in their lives and what governments and taxpayers can reasonably be asked to do as well. But look after your families, that's the key thing. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to, we've gone a little bit over time, I'm going to close with just a 30 second commentary on this. I think this has been an excellent panel because of the mixture we've had of, of, of Western and Chinese experts from all sorts of, uh, all sorts of different approaches. Um, as I look down the row, I think Mr. Zhang's point of listing the four factors that had to uh, occur, uh, but importantly, which we didn't come back to, was political reform and political system and democratization. Uh, however, and that, that means in Chinese terms, uh, we understand that, but I thought that was an important point. The openness, the environmental point, uh, 
that, uh, that John Hutton brought up. I'm going to come back to Jim Quigley in a second. Well, uh, Mr. Go, t touching on human capital, uh, also sp mentioning the political system uh, uh, and, and talking about innovation, the need for innovation, education system. Um, and, and I think the move up the chain in uh, manufacturing that Mr. Lujerin talked about, but also uh, making sure that uh, you don't lose your manufacturing and give it up, I think we've made some of that mistake in the United States going forward. And then I want to close by uh, pointing to two things that were said by Jim Quigley and Kyle, because I think they're quite important. Uh, Kyle Kofaser, it's not just, no country is poised to have more impact on the world in the next 20, 30 years than China. So this is not just a China issue, this is a world issue. The world has come to depend upon you, and it will depend upon you for leadership. I think what Kyle said was very important. You not only have to lead yourselves, but you also have to help lead the world that you've changed so much. And then finally, Jim Quigley said, whatever you achieved in the last 30 years, and as miraculous as it was, the next 30 will be far more difficult. But I think we've watched China come so far, and we have every expectation that, uh, that, that, that uh, you can keep playing this winning hand. Thank you so much to the panelists, and thank you to the audience. Thank you very much.